afternoon. If we have no vaccine for a virus and people are getting infected, like HIV-1, you can turn to antivirals. Uh, we can use antivirals when we don't have a vaccine or, whether, or when someone hasn't taken the vaccine and they get infected. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, so vaccines prevent diseases, as we said last time, but have little effect if you're already infected, except for rabies, of course, as we talked about last time. So we use antivirals, which can stop infection once it has started. So for Ebola, we do not have a licensed vaccine yet. We don't have any licensed antivirals, but some are being um, investigated. And if you happen to find an antiviral for another virus that works for, say, Ebola, that's been approved for another virus, you could use it for Ebola. You could do off-label use. It's called compassionate use. So that can be done. And in many cases, antivirals can stop infections that have started. Of course, you have to intervene soon enough to do that. As we showed with flu, you have to give an, a flu antiviral that within the first 48 hours of infection, otherwise it doesn't do any good. So we've been an researching antivirals for a long time, but we don't have very many to show for it. We have about 100 antiviral drugs available on the US market. Most of them, the licensed ones, so by market we're talking about licensed drugs, most of them are against HIV, Hep C, and herpes viruses. And what do they all have in common? They cause persistent infections. So these are viruses that infect you for a long time. So you have plenty of time to diagnose the infection and give a drug. You're not, in the, in the case of an acute infection that's over in four or five days, you're not time limited. So that's why many of our antivirals are against these as well. Nevertheless, when you have an outbreak of Ebola, even though it's a relatively quick infection, the symptoms are so clear that you have time to treat if we had an antiviral to treat against that infection. Now, why are there so few? Uh, a number of reasons. First of all, the drugs can affect the host cell. First of all, there are side effects, side effects of any drug. And these seem to be high in particular for antivirals because remember, viruses are parasites of the host cell. They depend on a lot of machinery of the host. Viruses may have their own enzymes for certain things, but remember, a lot of the transport, energy generation, lipid synthesis, et cetera, protein synthesis depends on the host. So it's hard to find something that's specific to a virus, because if you find a, a, virus, a, a function that overlaps with the host, and you make an inhibitor, that's going to be toxic, of course. So that's one problem, is that we have to find specific targets in the virus uh, replication cycle. Uh, another issue is that some viruses can't be propagated in the laboratory until uh, very recently. It was hard to grow hep B in human papillomavirus. It's still not terribly easy. Hep C couldn't be grown for years. In fact, most of the antivirals we have were developed before it was possible to grow hep C. And we'll talk about how you can do that in a bit. Uh, for smallpox, there is no animal model that's been accepted. And it's, you can, in the FDA, in the US, the FDA will not approve a drug unless it's been in two animal models, tested in two animal models. And so this is a problem for smallpox. The US government is trying to stockpile a large quantity of antivirals. They want two antivirals against smallpox. Why do we need this? Because it's eradicated. Well, in case someone does some bioterrorism and uh, we need to control an outbreak of smallpox, the US government wants some antivirals, but FDA says we don't have an animal model to approve these. Of course, we don't even have smallpox around to test the antivirals, so they're hard to test to begin with. But we don't even have an animal model. And of course, some viruses are very dangerous. You have to work with them under BSL-4 conditions, which is a very highly contained laboratory, very difficult to make uh, antivirals against them. Now, some of these limitations are changing. We, we're learning to grow virus into cell culture or get around the need to grow a virus in cell culture. Although, you know, you can identify antivirals using individual enzymes of a virus, but still at, this, at some point you want to test it on an infectious virus in cell culture and in an animal model. So that's a limitation. 
Uh, this is probably the most important region. A compound that is an antiviral has to block replication completely, 100%. In other words, it has to be potent. The aspirin you take when you have a headache, it doesn't 100% inhibit the enzyme or whatever the target. Whatever pharmaceutical you're taking uh, other than antivirals, they don't have to be 100% inhibitory. They work pretty well. It doesn't matter if they're 90 or 80% inhibitory of the target. Viruses have to be inhibited 100%. If not, we get resistant mutants. If we allow a little bit of replication in the presence of drug, perfect recipe for resistance. And that's why it's hard to make antivirals. You have to sort through lots and lots of candidates, and it turns out to be time consuming and very uh, expensive. So here's a graph illustrating this. We have uh, a viral load on the y-axis shown by the lines, the red lines. and. This is a replication, viral replication at different times after we give the drug. So this could be in cell culture. Let's say it's in cell culture. So the optimal dose, we have inhibition of viral replication uh, down to a very low point, hopefully zero, and that's it. But if we use intermediate or low doses, you see you have transient inhibition, and then the virus replicates. It's not enough to eliminate all the virus, and the low dose very low. Uh, as well. When you get virus replication in the presence of a drug, that's how you select for resistant mutants, because if, there's a, if there are a few resistant mutants in this population, they will outgrow and eventually take over the culture, and then you will not have any effect of your drug. So you have to have high potency uh, for these antivirals. Another problem is the very nature of the acute infection. Most uh, times when you feel sick, it's too late to impact clinical disease for a viral infection, that is. So you have to give them early an infection. And that's hard because it's hard to diagnose them early. Some, for example, you take influenza, you start to feel badly. Maybe in 24 hours you feel badly enough to go to the doctor. Then you go to the doctor, he or she thinks it's flu, you get a prescription. By the time you get to the drugstore, it's now 48 hours or more, and it's too late to impact the course of infection. And so we need to have rapid diagnostics for a lot of these acute infections. I have this vision that one day you will get up in the morning and stand in front of your mirror, which will scan you, and then it will tell you what infections you have. And if you have flu, it will transmit a prescription to the pharmacy. You can pick it up on the way. Or it will say, you're all clear today. You can go to work. It's going to happen for sure. I know it non-invasive diagnosis, but until then, we have to depend on a very slow system. Now, you could just give everyone antivirals, right? So let's say you have some sniffles, you go to the doctor, they suspect a viral infection, they could give you a broad spectrum antiviral. Well, we don't have any, so you can't do that. We do, do this often for bacterial infections. If you're suspected to have a bacterial infection, you will initially get a, long, a broad spectrum antibacterial until they identify what's growing in you, and then they'll give you a more targeted. We can't do that for viruses. We may one day, we may be able to give broad spectrum antivirals. I hope that day comes because then we will know how important our virome is for us, right? Because we'll get rid of our virome with this kind of treatment. But we're not there yet. Now, in general, you could give drugs to people who aren't sick with the idea of preventing them from getting sick, giving drugs to healthy people. That's usually not a good idea because that selects for resistance. It encourages indiscriminate use of, of antivirals. We know this is happening with antimicrobials. We have indiscriminate use leading to resistance and so forth. Although, now there is one exception to this, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we'll talk about later, which is used uh, for HIV to identify people at high risk for infection and let them take drugs before they're ever infected, which will prevent infection. This is a brand new thing that just start talking about this year because it's only been developed in the last couple of years. In general, we don't usually do that, but it's a special case uh, for HIV. So no broad spectrum antivirals, no good diagnostic tests. You know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Companies don't want to make diagnostic tests until they're antivirals, but nobody wants to develop an antiviral until they're a diagnostic test. So we are at a little bit of an impasse there. Now, speaking of broad spectrum antivirals, we don't really have any that will inhibit any virus. But here's an example of one called LJ1001 that inhibits envelope viruses. 
this is um, an a, a infectivity assay where um, activity here means that the drug is active in inhibiting replication. And so you can see a whole long, long list of viruses here in different families. The most important part of this table is whether it's enveloped or not. And you can see all the ones with a Y, meaning they have an envelope, they're all inhibited uh, by this antiviral. And adenovirus, Coxsackie, and rheoviruses, which do not have envelopes, are not inhibited. So this is quasi-broad spectrum, because the envelope covers a lot of different viruses. This uh, antiviral, it looks like this. It's an interesting uh, structure with three rings and a couple of side chains. And um, what it does is it trashes the envelope of envelope viruses. So here on the bottom is an assay where uh, vesicular stomatitis virus is mixed with a DMSO, which is the chemical used to dissolve the antiviral. Uh, one compound that's not active, LJ25, and then LJ1, which is active. So you can see the bullet-shaped particles of VSV present in the control. The inactive um, compound, the, the particles look good. And then uh, in those treated with LJ001, what you have are nucleocapsids left. The envelope is gone. It's been trashed. So the idea is that this compound inserts into the membrane and breaks it up. It has surprisingly very low toxicity. Now, why would that be? Because our cells have envelopes as well. Well, you know, our cells are dynamic. Our membranes are dynamic. They're turning over quite readily. So even if this drug causes damage in the cell envelope, it's quickly repaired. So that's why we think it's not toxic. Uh, but the virus particles, once they're made, they don't get any more envelope, of course. They are... They have what they get at budding, and uh, when you destroy it, that's it. It's not likely that this antiviral will ever be approved or so, uh, I'm told by its discoverer, because they're not sure of the mechanism, and that may limit its usefulness. But it's a good uh, example of how some kind of broad spectrum can be achieved by targeting specific parts of the particle. Let's talk a little bit about the history of antiviral development to give you a sense of where we started and how we got to where we are today. The first antivirals, uh, really, the search for them began in the 1950s. There had been a long, many years of success getting antibiotics or antimicrobials to treat bacterial infections. For example, the sulfonamide antibiotics the, uh, were, were, were ones that were active uh, against bacteria, and derivatives were made of these to see if they would, in fact, inhibit virus infections. Uh, some antivirals were made against pox viruses. This was still a problem globally after World War II, and thiosemicarbazones were made that were found to be active against those. And in fact, today, again, as I said before, we're, we have two candidate anti-smallpox drugs that were more recently developed, which remain to be licensed for the stockpile. In the 60s and 70s, what uh, chemists began to do was called blind screening programs to find uh, materials with antiviral activities. All of this, of course, uh, got impetus from the success treating, as I said, bacterial infections. A blind screen is where you take a collection of compounds and you simply throw it into cell culture and ask, does anything inhibit virus replication? Blind screen, because you're not targeting any particular part of the replication cycle. So companies wouldn't focus on a virus-specific me mechanism. What they would do is take random chemicals. So companies, pharmaceutical companies, accumulate chemicals over the year that they make for various reasons. They keep them all. They store them. You have vials and vials of these things. You can go into these libraries and check to see if any of those have antiviral activities. Product mixtures of various... Natural product mixtures were actually a uh, very popular source. You go out into nature and get some dirt and grow up whatever is in it, and see if the broth has antiviral activity. And um, people did this in all sorts of environments uh, globally. Quite interesting. Uh, and then from these kinds of screens, you would get hits, that is, compounds or mixtures that will block viral replication in cell culture. Then they start to purify it and see what's the active ingredient, um, see if they're inhibitory in cells after purification in animal models. Uh, and then they uh, start to make leads from the hits. 
And what they do is they take the hits and they modify them chemically to give them better properties, um, like more solubility, less toxicity, uh, higher potency, pharmacokinetic properties, and so forth. So starting with a collection of chemicals, you identify one or a few, and you, you modify them further uh, to make your final compound. And many, many molecules are typically screened before you ever get anywhere. And in the 60s and 70s, there was not a lot of success from this approach. Um, one of the outcomes that was, was a good success is this compound here, this unusual uh, chemical structure called Symmetrel, or the, the common name is amantadine. It was approved in the 60s to treat uh, influenza virus infections. And uh, it's still used in some cases uh, today, although we, we pretty much have a lot of resistance to this compound. And we use this along with two other drugs for flu that we'll talk about in a bit. Despite it being licensed in the 60s, we didn't know how it worked. And it, that wasn't figured out until the 1990s. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Now today, antiviral discovery is very different. We don't do blind screens anymore. We don't take a little bit of dirt that we've grown up and put it into cell culture and see if there's an active ingredient. We have very targeted and sophisticated pro approaches. We have recombinant DNA technology and really sophisticated chemistry that we put together. So you can take a gene, an essential gene of a virus, you can clone the, the DNA, you can produce the protein in E. coli or insect cells or yeast. Uh, you can purify the, the protein. Uh, you can then design assays to inhibit its activities. And of course, we know the replication cycles of viruses for the most part, as we talked about through the first half of this course, all the different steps. We know the proteins involved. So we can say, let's target this step uh, for designing an assay. And even if you can't grow the virus, you can have an enzyme, an RNA polymerase of the virus, for example, a protease of the virus, and design a screen to identify inhibitors of it. So you don't need to be able to grow the virus, although in the end you have to grow the virus in some way to show that that inhibitor inhibits infectivity, because after all that's going to be your end uh, assay. So we don't do blind screening procedures anymore, and a lot of companies don't even do natural products screening. So remember the replication cycle uh, that we talked about for all the seven classes of virus genomes. We divided it into a number of sections as shown here, and on the right are a variety of compounds that have been discovered to target these different stages of replication, and the virus is shown on the right. And pretty much we have inhibitors for all the main stages, attachment, uncoding, the synthesis of RNA, translation. Uh, DNA and RNA replication is a big one because we can target the polymerases. If they're viral, of course, can't target a cellular polymerase, that would be toxic. Um, and then we also have inhibitors of assembly uh, in, the, in the form of inhibitors of proteases. So let's take a look at uh, some of the ways that these compounds are devised, and then we'll look at some of them, how they work specifically. It's not easy to make any kind of drug, but antiviral drugs are particularly hard for the reasons we've talked about. And this is an overall flow to give you an idea of how this works. First, you start with a medical need, of course, which we talked about last time for vaccines. You have to have a virus that causes a, a, enough infections to make it worthwhile to put in hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, even billions of dollars of investment. Uh, and so five infections a year is not going to do it. So you, you identify a need, and then you have to do some research on the virus. Now, nowadays, we know most of the major classes of viruses. So a new virus that we've discovered, we can immediately slot into one of the known families, and we can already know a lot about its replication from previous studies as well. Uh, you need to then decide what step of the replication cycle you want to target. And you've got all those steps in the replication cycle at your disposal. Uh, and then you need to do a proof of principle, which is to say, show that the protein that you want to target is essential. All right, if you have a protease that you'd like to target, you better first take the protease out of the genome or alter it to show that that prevents viral replication before you spend millions and millions of dollars of your company's money trying to find an inhibitor only to learn that inhibiting 
that protease doesn't inhibit virus infectivity. That would be tragic, wouldn't it? But everybody knows to do this proof of principle. Uh, then you can devise a screen where you can use compounds of various sorts uh, to go through and identify inhibitors of whatever your target is. Um, you will identify from that hits, which you will then take and modify further to improve their capabilities. And so the chemists will partner with you uh, to do a variety of modifications of your compound uh, to improve it in a number of ways shown here. Will the compound get to the right place at the right concentration? That's bioavailability. So if you want to give a compound orally, you have to make sure it needs to go where it needs to go to inhibit your virus. If your virus is in the blood and that's where you want to target it, uh, you have to make sure the compound gets from the gut to the blood. You can't assume it will. It may not. Maybe the target is the brain. That would be a tough one. And you have to make sure that the drug goes from oral administration to the brain. Or maybe you can't give it orally. Maybe it has to be injected, which would be unfortunate. Anyway, you have to consider bioavailability. Pharmacokinetics, will it persist long enough to be effective? Many compounds initially are degraded very rapidly in the liver, so you have to modify them so they have a longer half-life. We also have to make sure they're safe. They have to be less toxic than the starting material and specific. So you start out with doing uh, assays in cell culture, and if the compound is toxic in cell culture, you just throw it out because there's no way it's going to go much further. And maybe it's good in cell culture after a few modifications, and then you put it in an animal and it's toxic, then you have to modify it further. If you think this is a promising candidate, it has good antiviral activities, you can modify it further until it's just the right specificity, toxicity, bioavailability, pharmacokinetics. All right, so then you, you do your animal model testing. You show initial studies to do toxicology, but at some point you have to have an infection model where you can give the drug and show that infection is prevented in two animal models. And once you have all that data, you go to the FDA and say, can I do a clinical trial? And you can put it in people. So this is a long process. And these are the different hurdles that I've talked about. So you start out with hundreds of thousands of compounds, and you check them initially for antiviral effect. Immediately you throw a bunch away that have no antiviral effect. And then some of them are toxic in cells. You throw those uh, away. And then this, this time you're doing some modifications, hopefully, to uh, improve some of the, the properties of the compound. Maybe you found some very active compounds uh, that are antiviral in cells. They happen to be toxic. So maybe you modify them to reduce the toxicity. Eventually, you get into animal experiments and show that they have antiviral effects. But again, many of them can be toxic in animals. So hopefully you can get around that. If not, you have to reject it. Then you have to do a clinical trial. Phase one will just be for safety. If it's too toxic in people, that's the end of the trial. Uh, often, though, if it's gotten through several animal models and it's safe, it's, it's safe in people as well. And eventually you have to do an antiviral trial, a phase two or a phase three, uh, which means you need to give it to people who are going to be infected. They have to be somewhere where they're going to catch the infection that you want to prevent. If there is no virus at the time, like Ebola at the moment, you can't test anything for Ebola because there's no Ebola around, but, which is good, but you can't proceed with any testing of vaccines or antivirals. And then eventually, maybe after 10 to 15 years, your compound will be approved. It costs a lot of money, $100, $200 million or more. Sometimes it can happen faster. It really depends on the need uh, and whether it's urgent enough to spur on people to be doing this and, and investment as well. Quite a difficult procedure. So here is a, another overview of the timeline in the different phases. Here we have years on the uh, x-axis. So our discovery of our drug initially, preclinical means all the antiviral studies in cells and in animals. You need that data before you can apply to do a clinical trial. Uh, then you do a phase one human clinical trial, which is Simply a small number of people, you give the compound and you ask, is it safe? Are there any bad side effects? If, if that's positive, you go on to a phase two, an efficacy trial, where you take people who are at risk for infection, you give them your drug, and you see what happens. And then if that is all good, if phase three is a bigger eff efficacy trial, uh, maybe you'll look at different doses as well in these trials. And finally, after these three phases, uh, you can go to the FDA with a huge binder of data and um, 
ask them to review your drug. You file an investigational new drug application. And then uh, they may approve it or they may not. And sometimes there, after approval, there is also a phase four where when it's used in the general population, you continue to monitor uh, the uh, side effects, the efficacy of the drug, and so forth. And throughout this, there is safety surveillance in the laboratory and in people to make sure the drug is safe. So a really long procedure, and that's why these drugs uh, are very expensive. So let's look at a couple of assays that are used these days. They're very clever. They're, they're limited only by your cleverness. If you want to work in industry and look for drugs, uh, you can do anything you want as long as it works and you have a clever assay. So these two I'm going to show you are pretty neat. This is a mechanism-based screen where we're looking for the, an inhibitor of a viral protease. There are a number of viruses that encode proteases that are pretty unique to the virus. They're not a lot like cellular proteases, so you could target them specifically. And so here we've devised an assay where we have a synthetic cleavage site. Let's say it's four amino acids. We know the cleavage site for the protease, so obviously you need to do some research to figure that out. A, B, C, D, the protease cleaves between uh, B and C. So we've derived, devised the synthetic substrate where at one end we have a bead linked to the peptide, at the other end is a fluorescent molecule. And so if the protease cleaves this substrate, uh, you can separate the uh, labeled part from the insoluble part with a very simple centrifugation step. You spin out the beads, they're heavy enough to come out on a low speed spin, and then you measure the fluorescence in the supernatant. And so you can see that here, fluorescence intensity of soluble peptide in time, uh, the peptide's released very quickly. And then you can very easily screen uh, a whole bunch of inhibitors of the protease for simply reducing the amount of um, soluble fluorescent material in the supernatant. So you can go through a whole series of drug candidates, thousands and thousands. They're all, it's all roboticized nowadays, so you don't actually have to do any pipetting. And you can go through many, many assays. The data are collected automatically. You can stay home on a Sunday morning and watch data flow in on your computer while you're having your coffee. And then if you get a hit, you can go in the lab and sort it out. All right, so that's a mechanism-based stream where we're looking at uh, a protease inhibitor, but we can also do a cell-based screen to do the same thing, and that's shown here. Now here the readout is going to be something that bacteria do. So what we've got is uh, a tetracycline resistance protein in the membrane of a bacterium. Uh, so this makes bacteria resistant to the antibiotic tetracycline. And what you do is you can engineer a protease cleavage site into one of these intracellular loops. So here we've put in the protease cleavage site for HIV. Now the idea is when you add HIV protease, HIV protease to these cells and you can introduce it into the bacteria on a plasmid, the protease will be made, it will cleave this loop and this uh, protein will no longer be able to make the bacteria resistant to tetracycline. Normally this uh, protein, this membrane protein will pump out the tetracycline. It can't do so when this is cleaved. And on, in the presence of uh, tetracycline, there will be no colonies of bacteria on an agar plate. So obviously you need to have a lot of other research before you can do this. You need to know uh, the, the nature of the protein that confers tetracycline resistance, the fact that you could put a, a few amino acids extra in here and not ruin the activity and so forth. But it's a really cool assay because then what you can do is add protease inhibitors to the bacteria, plate them out, and if you have a protease inhibitor shown in red here that blocks the protease, you'll have an active tetracycline efflux protein. You'll get colonies on the plate. So you can measure the potency of any candidate inhibitors by the number of colonies that you see on a plate. So just another way of doing a clever screen to get around doing a lot of manual labor to identify these compounds. And of course, if you have a single compound, you have to then go on and do all sorts of assays in infected cells, and you have to eventually get through modifying it so it's not toxic, it's bioavailable, and so forth. So this is just the beginning. So nowadays, uh, we do, and I say we, but I don't do any of this, we in the royal sense, we do high throughput screening. We can do thousands and thousands of compounds a day. We're just limited by how many compounds you can get your hands on. Uh, you can you can actually buy chemical libraries of all sorts. Companies have assembled collections of different chemicals that you can use if you want to find 
an inhibitor of a transcriptional activator. They have libraries that are made to be good for targeting those kinds of proteins. It's amazing what you can buy. You could also do natural products where you go outside and get dirt from different parts of the world, grow it up, and see what's in the broth. Uh, you can do combinatorial chemistry. This is very cool. You can, take, you can start with various chemical pieces, linkers and fragments of different sorts, uh, that are put together in, in different matrices to make thousands and thousands of individual chemicals. Fragment one, fragment two, for example, here. You get a matrix of different linkers. You can have different linkers and different fragments. So you can make many, many different chemicals very quickly, and you can test them all in your assay. You can do structure-based design. If you are looking for an inhibitor of a protease or a polymerase and you have its three-dimensional structure, you could look to see how the natural ligand fits into it and then try and design molecules that mimic it okay, and get close to it and they will sometimes inhibit. And you can even do this in silico. You don't even have to do the experiment. You can just design a whole range of compounds and have the computer ask, will they fit into the pocket? Pick the best ones out of thousands and then synthesize those and test those uh, in your assay. So really a remarkable revolution in antiviral testing. And as I said, this is all roboticized. Um, so some of you may be used to working in 96 well plates. Well, here we have a 1,536 well plate, which you would typically use to do an assay. You could put a different compound into each well. And we use robots to do the whole thing. Here's a robotic arm. Its movements are controlled by computer. And here is a robot arm putting material into each of the wells. So you could have it put your assay in everything first and then different compounds in each well. The, the robotic arm will take the trays and put them in the incubator for a specific amount of time. It'll then pull them out and assay them. It'll do everything, read the results, and put them on a file for you to look at. Really quite remarkable. High throughput screening. You can go through lots of compounds and uh, identify the drug that uh, is suitable for your assay. First question, we have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What is the reason for the difference? Robotic screening is slow. There are few serious viral infections. Resistance is a problem. Antivirals must be potent, all of the above. The answer is D, antivirals must be potent. Some of you picked robotic screening is slow, but it's actually very fast, right? That's the whole point. Um, resistance is a problem, but it doesn't limit us making them. It just limits how long we can use them. The potency is the real issue here. Unless you inhibit replication 100%, can't have an antiviral drug. Now, let's talk about resistance. Whatever drug you make, it will, you will get resistance to it. Even if you happen to target a cellular protein, which sometimes you do, but today we're talking about viral targets, you're always going to get resistance because viruses replicate really well and they have high mutation frequencies. And that's a problem for infections that last your lifetime, where you're getting drug your whole life, you're getting replication in the presence of drug, easy to select for resistant mutants. So of all the 100 plus antivirals we have, we've got resistance to all of them. And as I've said, Forever, as, as long as we keep making antivirals, we'll have resistance as well. That's how many mutants there are out there. And this is, a, this is annoying because we don't have a lot of antiviral drugs. What are the consequences of drug resistance? I think you could probably figure it out. Well, if you have a patient you're treating and uh, the virus becomes resistant, you can't treat with that drug anymore, obviously. Uh, if you don't have another drug, that's the end. Okay, that patient will probably die. Sometimes you do have alternatives, and you can try using those. However, on the good side, we can look at the mutations in these resistant mutants. We can sequence the genomes, figure out where the mutation lies that confers resistance. That helps us understand the mechanism. And if we know that, it may help us to make better antiviral drugs. So there, there is a silver line to this cloud of resistance. Now, how does resistance emerge? RNA viruses, well, both RNA and DNA viruses have error-prone polymerases. Their polymerases make mistakes at incorporating triphosphates into the template. In fact, they have to make mistakes in order to evolve, and we'll talk about that next week. You can't have a perfect polymerase. That kind of life form would not exist. So all these polymerases make mistakes. Ours do, of course. 
But RNA viruses don't have error correction mechanisms, so they are the highest mutation rates. They make one mistake in 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides polymerase, a million-fold more than DNA genomes, the host DNA genome. So in a virus, RNA virus of 10 KB, uh, that frequency will give you one mutation in one to 10 genomes. Every time the genome replicates, at least one mutation is sustained. And you think about millions and millions of genomes made uh, every day, then you can see that there's a lot of mutation. So a, a virus in replicating in a person is a collection of mutants. And if one of those is resistant to the drug, it will outgrow every other virus. And it's very easy to select. So that's the basis for mutation. DNA viruses uh, have error-prone DNA polymerases, but they have correction mechanisms that allow them to remove and replace misincorporated bases. And that's why they evolve more slowly than RNA viruses. They have less diversity. So here's what we're talking about. We have a DNA uh, strand in blue. It's being copied uh, by a DNA polymerase to make a light blue strand, the opposite polarity. Uh, the polymerase makes a misincorporation error. It puts the wrong base in, which it will do from time to time. But the uh, enzyme is associated with an exonuclease that will chew out the misincorporated base and then go back and continue <coughs> filling it in. So they're error correction, but they're not perfect either. So even DNA polymerases do make mistakes. So let's look at a couple of antiviral drugs and talk about how resistance emerges. Acyclovir, a very effective anti-herpes simplex virus drug. We still use derivatives of this today. This is what we call a prodrug. You'll see why in a moment, because what we give people is not actually the drug that inhibits the virus. And this is a nucleoside analog. Many antivirals are modifications of the four bases, whether they be DNA, as shown here, A, G, T, C, or RNA. You can modify them in various ways so that they inhibit the polymerase. So here is acyclovir. It's a variant of guanosine where we've taken off the, the sugar ring and made a different chemistry down here. And a derivative of that, which is, is very effective also, gancyclovir has uh, an extra hydroxyl you can see there. And you can see all these four bases, there are derivatives around the image here. These are all uh, chain terminators. These are antiviral compounds that are derivatives of G, A, T, and C. And these derivatives, if you look at them, they're chemically different from the starting compound, they inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. Now, acyclovir is a prodrug. What you do is you take acyclovir, if you have a herpetic lesion and you want to get acyclovir, you can do that. You can either put it on topically in a cream or you can take an oral pill. You'll be putting on or taking acyclovir, which is this compound on the left. It's not active. It gets into the cell and then is phosphorylated by a viral thymidine kinase, HSVTK. So acyclovir is not phosphorylated in uninfected cells. This is a beautiful antiviral. It will only be active in infected cells. Once it's, and the problem here is you can't give people triphosphates because they won't get into cells. They don't get across the membrane. So you have to put unphosphorylated compounds in they get phosphorylated by the herpes TK enzyme. It puts a phosphate on. And then cell enzymes take over for the next two phosphates. There's a GMP and an NDP kinase. These are cell enzymes that will then phosphorylate it. And the triphosphate is now active. It can be incorporated into growing DNA by the viral DNA polymerase. And because it's not right, it's missing this, the sugar ring, it will cause DNA synthesis to terminate. So it inhibits DNA synthesis and it makes it antiviral. But it doesn't inhibit cellular DNA synthesis. Of course, it does in the infected cell, but that doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't inhibit DNA synthesis in uninfected neighboring cells. So very low toxicity for this drug. Uh, not long after acyclovir was made, a derivative was produced. So that was given topically. But in some cases, if you had herpes and cephalitis, you needed to be given oral or IV acyclovir. And it wasn't very bioavailable. So valacyclovir was developed. And they added this valine group onto acyclovir. That was figured out by chemists, trial and error probably. And this makes it more bioavailable. In other words, you take it orally, and it goes to where you need it. And once it's taken orally, the valine is cleaved off by cellular enzymes, and you get acyclovir, and then that can go on 
get into cells, and if it's a herpes simplex infected cell, it'll get phosphorylated. So a really, really nice mechanism of action. Unfortunately, you, get, you do get acyclovir resistant herpes simplex. These arise, of course, spontaneous during, during virus replication. Uh, some of the mutants uh, cannot phosphorylate the prodrug. So these are mutants in TK that can't phosphorylate acyclovir. They can do everything else that they have to do quite normally. Uh, but they can't phosphorylate it, and so it can't be inhibitory. And others can't, the, that mutations are in the viral DNA polymerase gene, can't incorporate the phosphorylated drug into growing DNA chains. So there are two ways that the virus can become resistant, mutations in the TK gene or mutations in the DNA polymerase gene. You know, these are a big problem in AIDS patients, and particularly AIDS patients, as you know, are immunosuppressed. They tend to get repeated herpes infections, which are treated with acyclovir. When you get resistance, they get disseminated disease, uh, in, including virus entry into the, the brain and spinal cord. And uh, they, these mutants are often resistant to other analogs that are, have to be phosphorylated by the viral TK gene. There is one alternative, a inhibitor called Foscarnet, which is shown here. This is an inhibitor of the DNA polymerase with a different mechanism of action, so you can treat TK or polymerase resistant, acyclovir resistant viruses with this, but it has a lot of side effects. Uh, and if you end up being resistant to Foscarnet as well, there are no treatment options left. So we don't have a lot of uh, other drugs to treat herpes infections. Am uh, amantadine, that first flu compound discovered in the 60s, uh, we found out in the 90s that it actually interacts with the influenza viral M2 protein, which is the ion channel in the virus particle. And it blocks entry of protons into the virus particle and prevents uncoding. I know this is a long time ago, but influenza virus entry into cells is shown at the bottom here. Virus binds sialic acid receptors. It's taken up by endocytosis. As the endosome acidifies, that means proteins are pumped into the endosome, and that acidifies the endosome interior. Uh, that, those pro that low pH, of course, causes a change in conformation of the HA and leads to fusion of the virus and endosome membranes. But at the same time that the pH is dropping, those protons are being pumped into the interior of the virus particle by the M2 ion channel. They're actually not pumped in. It's not a pump. It's just a channel. They flow through it. And why is that important? It's important because the low pH of the virus interior allows the RNP to move out when the membrane fuses. And these RNPs go into the nucleus. If you put amantadine in an infected cell, the pH of the virus interior does not drop. The virus will still fuse, but the yarn peas will remain stuck to the vesicle because they haven't encountered low pH to allow them to dissociate and move into the nucleus. So all this was figured out long after the drug was discovered. And it actually, the use of this drug helped us to figure out how influenza uncoding worked. And this is often the case with many antivirals. It showed us an essential step, this uh, M2 channel. So this is a model of how amantadine is fitting into this channel. So there's the virus membrane, and there is the influenza M2 channel. It's a tetramer of sh four short uh, alpha helices, as you can see. It allows protons to pass through the endosome interior into the interior of the virus. And as those protons go in the virus, they acidify it and let the RNP loosen up. Uh, amantadine fits right into the channel. You can see it here in red. It interacts with side chains on the M2, and it blocks the channel. It prevents the protons from going through. So that's how it works. It's very easy to get resistance to amantadine. There are two kinds of resistance, and they're in the M2 ion channel. There are cha single amino acid changes in the amino acids that interact with amantadine. They prevent it from binding, or some changes actually maintain amantadine binding, but open up the channel so that protons can pass around it, if you will. So we have lots of resistance to uh, amantadine out there. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Acyclovir, amantadine, LJ001, penicillin, or all of the above? Answer is A, acyclovir, dimidine kinase is the enzyme that's the target. Amantadine is a channel, it's not an enzyme. LJ001 just trashes the membrane. 
Penicillin is what? Is that an antiviral? No. We have amantadine for influenza virus. We also have two neuraminidase inhibitors. You remember neuraminidase? Anybody remember that? That's the other glycoprotein in the virus particle besides the HA. And neuraminidase, one of its important roles is when the virus particles bud from the cell and are released. So here's a virus particle in the process of budding. You know, on the surface of cells, there are receptors for HA, sialic acid containing receptors. So newly budded particles would simply stick to the surface of cells as they come off. They would never spread. And um, it's the neuraminidase enzyme that cleaves sialic acid from the surface of the cell where the virus is budding to allow the virus particles to spread away. So it's really important for virus spread. And here is a three-dimensional structure of the neuraminidase enzyme. We're looking down at the top. It's a tetramer of four chains. And there is sialic acid fitting right in there. So what investigators did, they used in silico modeling. They said, let's make a compound that looks like sialic acid. And they designed these on computers. And then they started to synthesize them. And they found some that would actually fit in the neuraminidase and block the activity of the enzyme. So it could no longer cleave off sialic acid. That would mean that the virus particles would remain stuck on the surface of the cell. So here are the two inhibitors they designed, which ended up being licensed. Uh, Zanamivir or Relenza on the left, Oseltamivir or Tamiflu uh, on the right. And so again, they're designed to mimic the ligand of the neuraminidase, which is sialic acid. And the idea was, let's make these as close as possible to the natural ligand, and maybe we won't be able to get mutations because if a virus mutated to be resistant to the drug, it would also be unable to bind sialic acid and it would be dead, couldn't replicate. So that was the logic behind it, to make them very close. Um, in practice, it, it, it somewhat works. So here is a model of what's happening on the host cell as the virus is leaving the host cell. We have the, hemo the neuraminidase is shown as a Y molecule here. It's binding sialic acid. It's going to cleave it off the glycoprotein. right? It's going to clear the surface of sialic acid. Now, uh, zanamivir, of the two antivirals, zanamivir is the closest to looking like sialic acid. That's why I show it as a triangle here to match the sialic acid. Uh, and it's very, we, we don't see very much resistance to zanamivir at all. But oseltamivir is slightly different in shape from sialic acid. So it's possible for the neuraminidase to change and avoid oseltamivir binding, but it can still bind sialic acid. Okay, And so these are mutants that are fully infectious, but cannot bind oseltamivir, so they're drug resistant. And single amino acid changes at these positions have been identified in circulating viruses. So you treat people with these inhibitors, and then you isolate viruses from uh, people with flu, and you sequence and see which are resistant. And we can see we get resistance to uh, Tamiflu. Now, Tamiflu is an orally taken medication, far more distributed than is Zanamivir, which is inhaled. Many people cannot take an inhalant for various uh, reasons, asthma or whatever. So there's not a lot, as much distributed. Uh, but the idea is, again, that it's so close to sialic acid that we don't get uh, resistance. Now, the uh, CDC and uh, WHO have a worldwide network of laboratories that isolate virus, influenza viruses throughout the year, as we talked about yesterday. And what they do is they look for resistance patterns in these isolates. So this is neuraminidase inhibitor resistance testing on samples collected since October of last year. And you can see here the three different types of influenza, A, uh, H1N1, H3N2, and B. These are the ones that are circulating. These are the number of samples they've tested. And these are the resistant viruses. And you see there are no resistance this year to oseltamivir, Tamiflu, uh, Zanamivir, and Paramivir is a uh, intravenously injected preparation of uh, Zanamivir. So no resistance. So I just put this chart in this year. Last year's chart had, had lots of uh, Tamiflu resistance. So it changes from year to year. So the same viruses are not always around from year to year. Last year, we had quite a bit of uh, resistant viruses. Now, at the same time, all of these isolates, H1N1 and H3N2, are all resistant 
to amantadine. So we don't use it because of all the viruses out there. It would be 100% resistance to amantadine because it's been overused, not just by um, humans. It turns out that if you're a pig farmer in certain countries and you don't want your pigs to get flu, you, f you put amantadine in the feed. And you know, that's bad uh, and that selects for resistance. And people do that with antibiotics in animal feed and you have the same result. So we can't really use uh, amantadines uh, any longer. There's one other class of compounds I want to mention. They're called the wind compounds. These are not clinically useful, but they have been incredibly useful for helping explain how picornaviruses uncoat their nucleic acid. We mentioned these way back in lecture five, maybe, um, how these compounds fit into a pocket just below where the receptor binds in the virus particle. I'll remind you, these are icosahedral picornaviruses, five-fold axis of symmetry, the receptor binding site in a groove. Beneath the receptor binding site, there's a pore into which, in, in which there's usually a lipid. And when the receptor binds, the lipid leaves, and that gives conformational flexibility to these particles. Well, wind compounds uh, basically fit into that pocket. They displace the lipid, and they fit in so tightly they never leave, so the virus doesn't have conformational flexibility, and it can uncoat. So that's their mechanism of action. Unfortunately, they're not clinically useful because we have too much resistance, but in fact, we've had lots of uh, interesting findings, in including the one here of how um, uh, uncoating works by understanding that these compounds, one of which is shown here, displace the lipid uh, in this pocket. These were discovered in an interesting way, and I just want to show you this as an example, way back in the 1980s. So here is the starting compound. Uh, it's a long compound with a ring at one end, and you can see the final compound is very similar here. What's shown here are all the chemical modifications that were made to these compounds to try and find more, more active compounds, more stable, et cetera. And you can see these are all different chemical modifications here. And then uh, you look at the um, in, in, inhibitory dose here in micrograms per ml. You can see this one is 12, and this one is inactive as a compound. So the modification was no good. 25, inactive, inactive, 12, inactive. So you can see it's a hit or miss proposition. On the right, you can see how they messed with the number of carbons uh, linking this ring with the rest of the molecule. Right, so the original molecule had two carbons in between the ring and, and this part on the right. And you can see they did three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And three is inactive. The ones in the middle have some activity. Then nine is inactive again, and ten is active again. So I just want to show you this because it, it shows you how hit or miss the chemistry is. Really, the bottom line is you, any good antiviral program needs really good chemists in order to make the compounds that the virologists are going to test. We have now a whole bunch of new hepatitis C virus antivirals. When I started this course eight years ago, the only thing we had was interferon to treat hep C infected patients, which was horribly toxic and led to resistance. Uh, by producing individual viral enzymes, the polymerase uh, and the protease, it's been possible to identify a number of inhibitors uh, here is just one of them called telaprevir, which is an inhibitor of the hep C protease, and very potent, very effective drug. There are many others. This is the drug pipeline for hepatitis uh, C virus. You can see polymerase uh, inhibitors, both nucleoside and non-nucleoside, which we'll talk about in a moment, RNA binding proteins, protease inhibitors. All these are very good. Many of them are beyond phase three trials and have been licensed now, but the key here is that we have combination therapy now for uh, hep C, both double and triple drugs. So treating with more than one drug is how you avoid getting drug resistance. We'll go through that uh, in a moment. So that we now have for HIV, we have triple therapy. We now have it for hep C. So that d disease is going to be eradicable. HIV is the big one, of course, where we have inhibitors at nearly every step of the replication cycle, entry, fusion, reverse transcriptase, uh, protease integrase. And let's go through uh, some of these. Now, the problem with AIDS, of course, is you get infected for five, ten years or more. The virus is replicating. And if you give an antiviral, you're going to get resistance if you just give one. The first antiviral for 
uh, HIV was AZT. This was initially discovered as an anti-tumor compound. Um, it is a nucleoside analog. It's phosphorylated by cellular kinases, not by a viral kinase, and it acts as a, term a chain terminator. Um, it isn't a good substrate for uh, most cellular polymerases. It's better for the RT of HIV, but it is incorporated by cellular enzymes, and that's why it has a lot of toxicity. So here's how it works. AZT is given orally. It's phosphorylated by a series of cellular kinases, so there's no virus specificity, and it acts as a chain terminator. It doesn't have uh, the proper group here, it has a zeto group, uh, and it acts as a chain terminator for reverse transcriptase. Now, this was licensed in the very early years uh, of uh, AIDS. And in fact, if you've, if you've seen this movie, Dallas Buyers Club, that's the story of AZT. It's very cool. You should check it out because in this story, you know, very few people could get AZT. So the people who got it, they would take a dose and get terribly sick. So they came up with this homegrown idea of splitting the pills in half and sharing them with their friends. And they were still effective. And that actually led the uh, NIH to lower the dose. They were giving too much initially, and they could spread it out. So really good for explaining um, how that worked from a social level. So this is given orally, has a very short half-life, one hour. Now, you don't want a drug with a one hour half-life, because it means you have to keep taking it frequently, two to three times a day. But that was all they had, so it was licensed very quickly. In fact, the patient community was screaming for the FDA to license this because they had nothing else, so it was licensed quickly. Um, this short half-life multiple dose regimen was a problem, and mutants arose within the first year uh, of, the, of the licensing of this drug. A single amino acid changes in the reverse transcriptase, uh, and these mutated or altered reverse transcriptases do not bind the phosphorylated drug. So what would happen? New drugs were developed. Again, more nucleoside analogs, didanosine, zalcitabine, stavudine, lamivudine. These are all modifications of various bases, chain terminators. Uh, mutants resistant to all of those arose. They started using them in combinations of two, but still mutations arose that led to resistance of these two. Uh, uh, next, a series of non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors were developed. These do not act as chain terminators. They bind away from the active site of the enzyme. So a chain terminator binds in the active site, is incorporated into the growing chain, and causes it to stop. Non-nucleoside inhibitors bind somewhere else on the enzyme, and they cause an allosteric change in the enzyme so it no longer works. So here's the active site of the RT, the POM domain. And these non-nucleoside inhibitors bind away from it. And ones like nevirapine, delaverdine, and efavirenz were all made. And some of these are still used. These are the original chemical names. So you can see why they were shortened. But some of the shortened names are just as hard to pronounce, in my view, as well. Uh, these, again, mutants resistant to these drugs were selected rapidly. And, and these uh, have mutations in the reverse transcriptase that confer resistance to the drug. You can't use these um, by themselves. In fact, no drug can be used by itself anymore to treat AIDS. You get resistance far too quickly. So we always have to do combination therapy. We have protease inhibitors as well for HIV. Uh, the protease PR is this yellow protein, which is incorporated into the growing virus particle as part of a polyprotein. And after the virus buds, the protease makes final cleavages in the capsid and causes maturation after the virus has moved off the surface. So this enzyme was shown to be essential for infectivity very early on. It was a good target for antivirals because it's a viral enzyme. And so what people did was first identify the site that was cleaved on viral proteins by this protease. And that's shown here. It's a sequence of amino acids. And the cleavage happens between this tyrosine and this proline. And so what people made was chemical analogs to mimic this cleavage site. You can see sequinavir and darunavir are peptidomimetics. They are drugs that look like the cleavage site. The enzyme will bind to them. So here's 
HIV protease up here on the top, um, and a drug is binding right into the uh, active site. So the, the protease thinks this is a peptide to be cleaved. It's a drug that fits in there very tightly, and of course, nothing gets cleaved. You end up inhibiting uh, the protease. <clears throat> we also have integrase inhibitors. Remember, the integrase is a viral enzyme that takes the viral double-stranded DNA and nicks the host DNA, shown here in purple, ligates the viral DNA to it and causes integration of the viral DNA into the host. That integration is caused by the integrase. And on the bottom here is a high-resolution view of the active site of the integrase, very much like polymerases that use a three-metal mechanism of catalysis. Uh, so, do, so do the integrases. Glue, asp, asp are three uh, amino acids that coordinate magnesium metals that are needed for the joining of the three prime hydroxyl uh, of the DNAs together. And these two inhibitors, raltegravir and DTG, they bind in the active site. Uh, so raltegravir is binding right here across the metals, and you can see the other drug is doing a similar thing. So this blocks the ligation of the DNA, and so it prevents integration. So effectively, the viral DNA can't integrate into the host, so infection is stopped. So these are quite potent. And finally, we have an inhibitor of the co-receptor, CCR5. This is a very cool one. Remember, uh, HIV binding occurs when the glycoprotein GP120 uh, first binds to C CD4, and then that exposes a high affinity binding site on CCR5, the co-receptor, and that's needed for entry. Marav Maravirac is this molecule right here. It binds CCR5, that's the yellow uh, dot here in the diagram, and it allows the virus to bind to CD4, but it does not allow high affinity binding to CCR5. It changes the conformation of CCR5, so HIV can't bind with high affinity, and that blocks infection. So that's a very neat uh, inhibitor as well. So you can see by understanding every step of the virus life cycle, we can target uh, antivirals to each one. And our last question is, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest stage of infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, fusion inhibitors. Earliest stage of infection. So the earliest step among all of these, of course, is CCR5, which is the binding step. Next would be fusion, fusion inhibitors, and... Um, what would be next, either nucleoside or integrase inhibitors? Nucleoside, you have to make the DNA before you can integrate it, right? Now let's talk a little bit about combination therapy for HIV, which is revolutionized. It has made this into a chronic disease rather than a, a death sentence. It's also revolutionizing HCV treatment. Highly active antiretroviral therapy, HART, that's the acronym. And usually you have a pill with three different inhibitors that have different targets in the replication cycle. So here's the math to make you understand or have you understand why this works. You need one mutation for drug resistance, let's assume that. And the virus makes one mutation every 10,000 bases polymerized, roughly a genome. So every base is substituted in 10,000 viruses. Think about that. Every 10,000 viruses that are made Every base is, is substituted in that, that collection of viruses. It's enormous amount of mutation. Now, if you're infected, you make 10 to the 10th new virus particles a day. You divide 10 to the 10th by uh, 10 to the 4, which is uh, every base substituted in 10 to the 4 viruses. You're going to make a million viruses every day with resistance to one drug. A million a day. That is assuming full replication, of course, which may not be the case. The drug is going to do some inhibition but you've got a lot of resistance. That's why you give a person AZT, and within maybe a month, you have resistance. So that's one drug. If you do two drugs, resistance is, a, is multiplying the two frequencies, 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 4, developing resistance. You need 10 to the 8th. Uh, so if you have 10 to the 10th particles a day, divided by 10 to the 8th, you you're going to make 100 viruses resistant to two drugs a day. 
And again, this is assuming zero inhibition by the drug. So the drugs will inhibit somewhat, but eventually you're going to have 100 viruses that are resistant. And that's why we see resistance to two drugs. Now, for three drugs, we multiply the three resistance frequencies, 10-4, 10-4, 10-4. You need 10 to the 12th viruses to get resistance to three drugs in one virus. And that um, happens very infrequently. It does happen. All right, it does happen, especially if people stop taking drugs for whatever reason. Some people just do not want to take drugs or they don't feel good, and that lets viruses that are somewhat resistant amplify, and then when you go back, you have resistance. And of course, these numbers are ideal situations assuming full replication. But the drug is going to inhibit replication, so it will take longer than a day or, or two days or so. So the, the drug development for HIV is amazing because it's a big problem, as we'll talk about later. These are all the drugs that have been approved so far by the FDA. These are the, the dates of approval. And what is really cool here is look at the time to approval. It usually takes years to approve a drug, three months, six months, five months, four months. So a lot of these were fast-tracked due to pressure from patient groups, advocacy groups. The FDA recognized the need, and they responded, which is really good. And here they are divided by mechanism of action, nucleoside RT inhibitors. You can see them all here, different companies, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, fusion inhibitors is one, there's one entry inhibitor, a couple of, sorry, there are two of each. Is there two? No, that's the generic name. Uh, here's a uh, integrase inhibitor. And finally, here are the uh, multiple combination pills. When this chart was made, there was just one called a tripla, which was a combination of efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate. I think for extra credit, I'll have you pronounce all of these. How's that? I never thought of that before. Uh, now we have other pills that are triple therapy, complera, and... Uh, Stribild. All right, so now there are three available. So if you're on one triple therapy and you develop resistance, you can go on another. But typically what will happen is if you're HIV infected, your doc will have your genome, the genome of your virus sequence, and they will know what resistant mutations are there. So they will tailor the drug according to your resistance profile. That can give you a drug to which you already are resistant. Uh, ART works. Lots of people are re receiving uh, antiretroviral therapy. Initially, when these drugs were made, not enough people in the important regions like the African regions were getting it, but that's getting much, much better. Uh, and it's saving lots of lives. As of 2012, 4.2 million adult lives are saved by using these drugs, and maybe, very importantly, 800,000 child infections were prevented. Now, we do now use pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a brand new thing because we usually don't want to give drugs to healthy people. But these are double therapy, two different drugs, not triple. For those people at high risk for infection, they, risk, they reduce the risk of sexual transmission by 90%, uh, intravenous drug use transmission by 70%. And uh, of course, if you use a condom with this, it reduces it even more. Now, uh, people always wonder whether giving people drugs before they're infected is bad because it's going to select for resistance. In all the clinical trials that were done, no resistance was observed, but the clinical trial is not the real world, right? So we're still waiting to see whether any resistance is going to come up. But right now, this takes people who are at high risk for infection, do not change their behavior to prevent them uh, from being infected. And there's one paper here that reviews some of the data uh, for this. All right, so let me end by reminding you there are 10 to the 16th genomes of HIV on the planet today. Uh, in those 10 to the 16th is resistance to all the antivirals I showed you on that chart, as well as anything we will ever develop. Amazingly, triple therapy has solved much of this problem. Now the problem is getting those drugs to people who need them, and we'll talk about that when we talk about HIV.